Thank you, I am Wyatt from Long Range Gear and this is Andrew and today we're going to show you the rebuild process of a Dodge ND 5600 six-speed manual transmission. Uh, these transmissions were available behind a V10 or a Cummins uh, engine in the Dodge Rams from 99 to about 2005, mid-year. Very heavy duty six-speed. This one came out of an 04 with compounds and some healthy upgrades. Uh, it's got some carnage inside, at least third gear's gone. So we're gonna go through, uh, we're gonna rebuild this thing back to factory spec. We're gonna replace all the broken stuff and get her back on the road. Good. All right, so first step is to take off the extension housing. This is a four-wheel drive unit. Uh, four, uh, 15 millimeter socket gets all the outside bolts out. Then we also have to take the uh, detent plug out right here. And then this guy up here, we'll pull all this off. There's a spring and a little ball bearing type uh, piece in there that will come out with, with everything. And then we can pull this off and we'll show the puller next. Okay, so to remove the extension housing, uh, again, we got all the perimeter bolts around. Uh, we're going to be using Miller 8244. Uh, it's a specialized puller for getting this uh, guy off here. It's, uh, it's got anaerobic sealing all the way around, and there's a roller bearing that it's pressed onto, so it takes a whole lot of force. Uh, Wyatt, can you step in here with the... So we're going to tighten this down, and it's going to lift the whole thing. Don't be surprised if you got to smack it with a hammer on both sides to help loosen it up. This was the easiest removal of an extension housing in the history of the <laughs> yeah. This come off fairly easily. These main shaft nuts are a single use item. They must be replaced every time you build it. You can get them from 4 King 4x4. But when you remove them, they need to be discarded. They're no longer good. So then, the roller bearing can come off. There's a thrust washer underneath that's unique. There's a small raised portion. Uh, make sure you get it in the right direction. Um, your reverse gear comes off pretty easy. This one seems to be in pretty good shape. The needle bearing will slide off. Your reverse gear race. It is a press fit. It's not exceptionally tight. Sometimes it helps to move your synchronizers. How this is supposed to go. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, it's got goop on it. Yeah. <laughs> yep, I'm fine. Oh, no. okay. uh, so there's a reverse. Um, your reverse inner ring. So this is your, your synchronizer assembly. So this engages with your gear, these little slots on the synchronizer actually fit into the gear and your um, blocker ring fits over the top and that's what creates that friction to speed the gear up. Uh, you can kind of keep this all as one piece and set it aside. So next we need a, uh, a small roll pin, uh, punch for this roll pin right here in the reverse shift fork. I think it's a 3 16 Okay, so <laughs> we're good. Alright, so the next step is going to be punching out this roll pin on the reverse shift fork. You'll just punch it inwards. Um, if you get any sort of interference with the slider, or the, I'm sorry, the, the hub assembly, you can slightly lift up on it. 
uh, to help clear that. I'm trying to do this not in the way of the camera. Okay. So there's your roll pin. You can also get these a torquing 4x4. Yeah. Alright, so you can gently pry up um, on your reverse shift fork. Your hub is, or I'm, I'm sorry, your slider is going to move on the hub, and there's going to be three little keys and springs with little check balls on. They're going to go flying, there's not really a whole way to, or a whole lot you can do to stop that. Try to keep track of them. If they fall down into your transmission, don't worry about it, because we're going to be taking it all apart when we find them. So, take note of your orientation on your hub. There's a small identification ring um, for direction. Keep it that way. Set it up side. And then your little keys here, you'll see there's a small, a very small spring, a very small little key, and a ball bearing. There's three sets of this inside. And then you can raise your reverse hub. Uh, and Okay, so we're going to start um, detaching the case from the bell housing. There's um, five bolts that are on the outside of the bell housing. You can remove these and we'll have to um, set it down on its belly to remove the rest of them. It's generally helpful to leave maybe one end kind of hand tight just to help keep things attached while you're moving. Okay, so to get to the remaining bell housing bolts, we're going to have to tilt. It's kind of heavy, so be careful. We've got to tilt the transmission over, and we can access the remaining bell housing bolts from the inside. Okay, so we're going to remove these uh, perimeter bolts right here. Um, I like to stand on both sides of the transmission to kind of hold it upright. Um, they're not under a ton of torque, but oftentimes there's a lot of Loctite, um, so it kind of makes them hard to... You get loose sometimes, and this keeps from the transmission from rolling over on you. Okay, so now to remove the case uh, from the bell housing, we're going to lift it up and over the shafts. Um, you can do this with just regular bolts or a, or a strap, but what makes it much easier is using, we have Miller 8232, it's one of the original um, the kits manufactured uh, for rebuilding these. Um, really adds a nice element of stability, I encourage you to find some, uh, but any strap and some bolts, as long as they're sturdy, will work. Um, these are supposed to be held onto the bell housing with anaerobic sealant. Um, if it's been rebuilt before, oftentimes somebody's just throwing a bunch of RTV in there. If you got RTV, it's pretty easy to break loose, but if you have the anaerobic sealant in there from like an original build, sometimes it can be stuck on there pretty good. So having these nice little hooks really helps. Cool. Uh, one thing we neglected to mention is uh, another roll pin that's inside of the uh, shifter ball mount. You have to press that in and rotate the shifter ball in order to clear the housing when you go to lift. Um, when, you, when you knock it through, it's going to go into the transmission. Uh, that's fine. Again, we're going to be disassembling it. So once the roll pin's pushed out, you have to rotate this. Uh, it's almost 180 degrees out of the way in order to clear the case.
So, as you can see here, now um, the rest of the gearbox is exposed. Um, what you have to do from this point, and I need to take a moment to explain it, um, you need to lift the two shafts together uh, at the same time. Uh, you need to get up about an inch and a half to be able to remove the shift rails. It's really hard to do that without having the, the proper tool, but you can sometimes spool a cable around the, um, the, the gears and uh, uh, first gear up here and underneath this. Uh, make sure if you do tie it up that you're not tying up the shift rails um, or you're going to get stuck like that. <coughs> um, as you can see, we've got all kinds of carnage right here. Uh, looks like at least one bearing came apart, maybe more. Uh, looks like there's some small chunks of broken metal, like we have a busted gear. Uh, this should be fun. Uh, do you want to, so we need that piece? Um, all right. Okay, so to lift the shafts up and out of the bell housing, um, what we're going to use is Miller tool number 8232. There's a special lifting mechanism to help you lift the shafts straight up without them clanking together, chipping teeth, or dropping something. Um, so it's, it's pretty simple. Um, you're going to install the long shaft here into the, count, the back of the counter shaft. Okay, just nice and snug. Um, you're going to see this lifting point is going to go right over there. You can use a, um, a rear extension housing bolt um, or you know, whatever, you, whatever you choose. Uh, you can run that down into the main shaft. Um, and if you make sure to keep it nice and flush, uh, make sure the bar is flush with the top uh, of the back of the main shaft here. Um, adjust the nut accordingly to make it nice and level. I'm going to take the top nut here and run this down. Oh. Okay. So now what we can do is bring the cherry picker back over and hoist from here, and we're going to lift these straight up. You got to come up about an inch and a half so we can pull this whole crazy shift rail assembly out um, and then we can move the shafts over to the table. So one thing we did want to detail um, is about the shift rails here before we start lifting stuff. Um, you're going to have several components here that are inter, um, kind of intertwined in a complicated manner. Um, <clears throat> so what you're going to notice is your 3-4 um, shift rail, is, this is all one piece and that's kind of a um, it goes directly behind your, your 1 2 shift fork little pawl. Um, then you have uh, this main, main guy in the middle, and then you have this floater on the back. So it's very complicated when you go to rebuild this. Make sure you take a lot of photos about the orientation of this section of the shift wheels. Um, additionally, the 5 6 over here has a crossover shaft and a cam little pivot point. Uh, we have to remove these bolts. Um, but take note of uh, the orientation of the crossbar, um, and then you'll notice there's an interlocking piece. Um, and this is the part where you're really going to lose your mind um, trying to align all of these together. So make sure you take a lot of photos so you don't make it worse. So what we're going to do, um, these, are, these are 10 millimeter. They're oftentimes... They are Loctited in, um, but they are into aluminum, so be careful, don't be hitting them with the impact or anything like that. So this is your 5-6 crossover. I'm going to be gentle again, it's into aluminum. Um, so this is the first part of the shift rails to remove. Um, you can't start hoisting while this is still bolted in, or you're going to end up jammed up. Not the, not the teeny tiny one, but the medium one. So these are your two bolts for that. You're going to start slowly and carefully removing your, your crossover now. Okay. So there's a dowel underneath, and once it's loose, it'll kind of pop off. If it doesn't pop off, that's fine. When you go to lift your shift rails off, it'll come off. Um, this little mechanism right here, and keep all this separate. And once that's removed, we can move the cherry picker over and start working. 
Okay, so now we're going to start lifting. Um, we've got our fixture tightened down. It's hooked up to just a simple cherry picker. So we're going to go up about an inch and a half, maybe. Uh, go ahead, Black. Um, nothing's, nothing's retaining it. It's all loose. You just kind of got to spin it in shape. One more. Keep going. Okay, right there. So now at this point, we can start removing some shift rails. Um, again, take a lot of photos and you can see how it all comes apart. So this, this guy is the one that will be all the way in the back. So that's the 5.6. It just comes right up as well. It's very simple. 3.4 um, here pops right off as one big assembly. And then your, uh, your main 1.2. Um, as you can see, there's a little interlock. That's all that holds them together. When you go to reassemble, you put this in kind of angle it like that. Um, you can clean these effectively without taking them apart. So if you're a little um, nervous about disassembling it, you can leave it like this and just maneuver the shafts to clean all the stuff up. Hold on. What you're going to notice about this when you, when you get a little bit further on, there's actually three, three shafts that are inside this transmission. There's your main shaft, there's your counter shaft, but the input shaft down here is separate. There's nothing connecting, um, when it's out of gear anyway, there's nothing connecting the input to the main shaft. Um, so what you're going to do, you can, as you raise it up a little bit, you can see the counter shaft will lift the input slightly. But when, from here, when you start manipulating it, that will all come apart and you'll lose your springs and detents. So what um, I found is my preference, actually, is just these little clamps you can get them in any hardware store. And I will clamp the entire hub, which gets the six gear engagement flange and the input shaft engagement flange. This will make a little bit more sense when we get further on. Um, but make sure you clamp these. Uh, it'll hold it all together. It'll keep you from making a mess um, as you lift. <clears throat> so now, why it's going to start cranking, and we're going to lift this shaft assembly, uh, both the shaft assemblies out. Um, you got to make sure the input shaft clears the, uh, the bearing pocket. Just like that. And you can see, um, because these are loose um, and they'll flop around here, if you don't have some sort of fixturing like this, it can get a little complicated. You can kink it in uh, the bell housing as you're lifting. Uh, but now you're, now you're free. This assembly can be set on the table and we can start working on this alone. Okay, so I'd like to take a moment and talk about how this actually works uh, inside of your, your transmission. Um, as I was mentioning before, you actually have three shafts in here, not just two. You have this input shaft. Um, why can you grab one of the spare input shafts out of the thing? Um, so we have an input shaft, we have a main shaft, and we have a counter shaft. <clears throat> so the power flow through this thing, essentially when you have your clutch is released, when your foot is off the clutch, your input shaft is always spinning and your input shaft is always spinning the counter shaft. So you have this through here and here. This is always, ro this is always rotating with engine RPM. <clears throat> so when you actually make a gear selection, you're not connecting any gears. These are all in constant mesh at all times. Um, but what you'll notice is these speed gears, um, they're, these speed gears move on a bearing on the shaft. Um, so these are all free spinning. When you make a gear selection, what you do is you move the hub over and it engages the gear, which is bearing mounted, to the hub, which is splined to the shaft. Now if that gets a little confusing, don't worry. <clears throat> what will happen here is the power will come in, it'll turn this gear, which will turn this gear, and this is always spinning. This is what you get your lubrication from, it's flinging oil everywhere. But your main shaft will remain turning at the speed of your drive shaft. Essentially, this is always connected to the rear to the rear wheels. Um, so when you actually make a shift, your synchronizer assemblies, which are between the gears and the hub, um, they will speed the shaft to make the gear, essentially. Um, and at this time, you have your clutch depressed. The input shaft, in theory, is not spinning, or there's no load on it, at least. Um, so you can actually spin the gear to match the shaft, <coughs> to match the shaft speed for a nice, smooth engagement just like that. So at that point, um, say we're in, um, we're in fourth gear right now, uh, the, uh, the power flow would be through the input shaft, down to the counter shaft, 
all the way over to third gear. Well, it's actually through the hub to third gear, um, which would then go to the main shaft and out to the drive shaft. Um, and then obviously when you deselect that gear, you can select first right here, and the power flow would be up through the gear into the main shaft and out. So when you hear a grinding sensation, <clears throat> when you hear a grinding sensation, it's not actually two gears together, it's this engagement hub, uh, I'm sorry, this engagement plate with your hub, it's making this, uh, this sort of noise. With a load and RPM, obviously it's gonna sound a little different, but that's how uh, the power transfers in through the input shaft through whatever selection you've made to the output shaft. And that's why it's so important to make sure your synchronizers uh, are in good shape, your hubs are in good shape, and the teeth right here have a nice little house shape to them, and that'll make a nice smooth engagement. When you, As you can see, the gear rotated slightly to match. That's kind of the purpose. Um, if the speeds aren't matched, um, it'll lock you out of the gear until they are matched, and then you can engage them. That's good. Okay, so we're going to take a moment and talk about the differences in the gears. Um, as we mentioned in the intro, these transmissions were offered from 99 to mid-year 05. Um, in 1999, 2000, and early 2001, uh, they used an entirely different style gear in synchro. <clears throat> I have an example of both of them here. Um, and what you're going to notice, um, there's a, this is the new style, this is the old style. On this new style, there's a ridge that comes out about midway between this square and follows the whole circumference around. This is the new style. The old style here doesn't have that written. I mean, it's got a small one right here, but it's, it doesn't come out all the way. Um, and then there's a valley <clears throat> uh, every third. So the only style synchronizers that are reproduced at this time are the new style. This is a new style. It's pretty worn, but this is a new style. <clears throat> so how it works is you'll set it right on the gear here. As you can see, that raised profile, that raised, um, that raised edge there, is the same exact circumference as this um, synchronizer ring, and it keeps it up at the proper spacing to engage with, oops, to engage with the blocker ring. And this blocker ring goes between the hub. When you move the, the, the hub to select a gear, basically what you're doing is you're pushing down on this, and it locks the gear together. Okay, it's just kind of like a brake pad or something like that. This brass is a friction material. <coughs> So if you see a sinker, if you take your transmission apart and see a sinker with all flat sections around here, and you see this raised uh, perimeter, um, congratulations, you're lucky. That's from mid-year 2001 up till the end of the run. <clears throat> These old style synchronizers, they don't have that raised portion, um, and then they have this valley. The old style synchronizers will have these tiny little humps every third one. It's, it's like, it's very noticeably different from this. And what um, on these old style synchronizers, those hubs are what go in the, I mean, the, the bumps go into the valley here, and that's what sets the spacing. Well, they don't make those synchronizer rings anymore. <clears throat> All we have is the new one. They lack those little humps there. So when you actually put um, a blocker ring on, it'll just spin. It will not grab to shift at all. Like, if you reassemble your transmission with the new synchronizers on the old gears, um, you're going to have horrendous grinding on three through four. Um, first and second gear uh, in the old style, because they have an inner synchronizer, you're going to see that when we get to that point. You can get away with running those. Those are fine. But three through six in reverse, if you're seeing this, um, there's two ways to solve that, because these are the only synchronizers you can get. Upgrade your gears to the newer style, which all of them are available through Torque King 4x4. They're quality components. Um, there's also a shim available um, that will fit under here to space the um, to space the, the synchronizer to the right height off of the old gears. I've heard mixed uh, mixed reviews about the reliability. I've never personally used them. Um, I am going. I have an old style transmission. I'm going to test it out myself, but I probably wouldn't go with that for a permanent solution. The best way to do it is to just simply upgrade your gears, get nice replacement synchronizer rings. Um, if your blocker rings are in good shape, you can still use those, but as you can see, they will lock the gear and allow you to synchronize the transmission. Um, so, 
on the topic of the old style versus new style um, uh, gears in your transmission here, um, another indicator of whether you have the old style or the new style, um, you could use the size of the input shaft. The early inputs uh, were inch and a quarter, um, whereas from mid-year 2001 and up, uh, they went, or I'm sorry, from um, 2001 to 2005, they used an inch and three eighths. Um, now, the problem where it gets confusing is a lot of people think inch and a quarter means old synchronizer, and that's not the case. Here I have an inch and three eighths factory out of my 2001 um, that has the old style synchros. So if, you're ha if you have a 2001 um, model transmission and it has an inch and three eighths input, um, you may want to pop the shifter and look down in. Sometimes you can see those little humps on the synchronizer. Um, if you position things right, but it's really hard to do. Uh, so just keep in mind that although it may have an inch and three-eighths input, you still obviously can't have the old synchronizer assembly. Um, here's the one we just uh, took off of the shaft uh, from the transmission we disassembled, and it has the new style and the old style right next to it. All right, so we are now um, moving on to breaking down the shafts. So we have the, um, the counter shaft assembly setting here right now. This is six gear on the counter shaft. Um, and we have it set kind of, you know, just propped up here, um, hanging out the bottom on this, on, this, uh, on this press. You can use some sort of fixturing setup to remove these bearings. It doesn't necessarily have to be this press. Uh, but we're going to start off by removing this um, fitted retaining ring. Uh, if my worn out snap ring pliers will do it. Want some better ones? Now I got it. I mean, yes, I do want some better ones. <laughs> um, so these snap rings here, um, these are actually fitted to each application. Uh, Torquing 4x4 sells an entire kit for um, the different size, both shims for a setting end plate and these snap rings. So when you're doing reassembly, you want to make sure that you fill that gap and it's nice and tight and it um, snaps all the way into the groove uh, and doesn't wiggle around. Um, that keeps your gears from moving under, under load. Um, so now, we have that snap ring off, we can set that aside, <clears throat> we need to remove this bearing. So the tool we're going to use for that is the Miller 6444 puller, and these jaws, which are, this is the Miller 6451, and these are you, this, these jaws specifically are used for the, um, the front counter shaft bearing, which is what we're removing right now. So you kind of set them into place, it gets underneath the bearing, it grabs onto this collar, okay. And um, if you're doing this at home, um, if you're doing this at home, you can certainly use a bearing splitter. Uh, I've done it before. It's absolutely terrible to do, but um, if you don't lose your mind beforehand, you can eventually get it off. But you'll see that this makes really quick work of it. I really encourage you um, to pick some of these up. These bearings are going to be very tight, so all you're going to do. Take this down. And we're moving. Boop. There were no flaws in this bearing removal, period. <laughs> no pauses whatsoever. It's just off electricity. <laughs> the power flashed off for a second. What was that? Okay, so. As you can tell, as you start to tighten this down, the bearing's coming off the end of the counter shaft there. And I think we're about loose. Take our off. And you can see that inside these bars, it pulls the bearing right off. No need to cut it, no need to hit it with a torch, burn it, possibly mess up the shafts. These counter shafts are very expensive. Counter shafts are very expensive, kind of hard to find. Uh, I suggest taking every precaution to not ruin them. So now this part, this is one of another specialty tool you're going to need. Um, six gear counter shaft and fifth gear counter shaft are both splined to the counter shaft itself, and they're under a ton of a ton of pressure. So what we're going to do, um, we got it kind of set up here. We're ready to start pressing. One thing I did want to mention. We've got a really nice 50 ton press here um, at Torquing 4x4. Um, we have one back at our shop uh, as well, it's 50 ton. Um, we have also tried this in a 20 ton and uh, 
absolutely cannot recommend attempting that at all. We've broken teeth off gears. It doesn't work. Um, I've bent the pins on those things in half. Um, I have a picture we can splice in. Um, it's, it's a really bad idea. You're probably going to break stuff. Um, what you can do, we go, um, you know, sometimes if our, you know, whatever we got too much going on, we can go down to a local tractor repair shop, they'll have something like this, or you can go to, um, you know, maybe a transmission shop in a, in a town near you. They might be willing to press these gears off for you for 30, 40, 50 bucks, something. Um, these gears are, you know, pushing 200 a piece, depending on where you get them. Um, so you're going to save your, yourself time and money in the long run um, to, to get a real press set up somehow. Okay? Cool. Um, do you want to you be the pedal man and I'll catch this thing? Sure. Okay, so what we're going to do now, uh, we've, we've kind of got uh, a little pressing set up on the counter shaft. The uh, sixth gear is supported completely with these nice arbor plates. Um, you need to get a lot of purchase on this because it takes a lot of force. Wyatt's going to step on the little pneumatic pedal here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch the shaft. I don't really like letting them fall. Go ahead, Wyatt. Uh. Okay, raise it up. Stop. There you go. Good? Yeah. As you can see, there are some pretty crazy splines here on this counter shaft. So we will remove six gear there. It's nice and tacked because we didn't try this with a cheap press. We clean this up. Um, I'm sorry, that was, I, I've been referring to that as six gear. That's fifth gear counter shaft. I'm sorry. Fifth gear counter shaft comes off easy. Six gear here is. This is the big one. This is the difficult one. Okay. Now, obviously, you're not going to be able to get as much purchase on there because of, um, you know, you have some other gears and possibly the hub. You can move the hub out of the way if you have a thin enough arbor plate. You want to make sure worried that you're breaking it. <laughs> So now we're going to press off sixth gear uh, from the counter shaft. This one's under a little bit more pressure than uh, fifth gear on top. So normally I just support it with, uh, with these arbor presses and it's always worked fine. Uh, Torquing 4x4 uh, has got quite the setup here. And they have this uh, OTC super mega uh, massive 11 billion pound PSI capable <laughs> <laughs> spinner splitter uh, that I couldn't resist trying. Um, this thing's absolutely huge. We're gonna it, it, what it's doing right now is giving us a little bit more purchase underneath the gear. Um, and again, just using the arbor plates, I've never had one of these break when it's properly supported with a 50 ton. Um, <clears throat> the uh, the arbor plates are enough, but this is obviously giving us a lot more. I really want to try it. Um, this is quite a piece, so we're gonna give it a whirl. We're gonna see how it works. Okay. Go ahead, Wyatt. Uh, this thing works really well. There we go, we're going to go back a little bit. Alright, so we've got our counter shaft disassembled. This is the orientation that it would go in. So, sitting in your transmission, this is, this is how um, it's supported. So, you got first gear and second gear. These are actually part of um, the counter shaft assembly. You have third gear, which is supposed to, supposed to be mounted on a bearing. Uh, this one obviously is not. Um, you have fourth gear here. This is um, so it goes in order up until these counter shaft gears. This is actually sixth gear that goes up against um, this gear here, and then fifth gear goes on the side. So uh, the input shaft turns fifth gear and turns this whole assembly. This hub um, is for third and fourth um, for you, when you select those gears. So continuing disassembly, and as you can see, some of my keyways came out. I was moving it around. So simply, you can lift up on the gear, take it up off the shaft, 
One thing you want to, when you start looking at these, these speed gears that are bearing mounted, the engagement teeth um, for the synchronizer, they should have a nice point, and they, you'll see from the side, um, they should be kind of house shaped. There's like a, like a back cut angle sort of a thing, and that helps it hold uh, itself into gear when the, the slider goes over it. So make sure you got at least a decent looking tooth pattern on your synchronizer teeth here. Um, if not, you can simply just get a replacing gear. Um, you, you don't want to be like mashing up against a, a worn, a worn little tooth. Okay. So there's that guy. We have our two-piece inner needle bearing. Um, most of them are not two-piece, but. Um, and then you have the synchronizer assembly here. So this synchronizer, this actually looks really good. Um, it's, it's definitely got a little bit of mileage on it, but this is a really good looking synchronizer um, considering it's a used transmission. <clears throat> um, but if you'll notice on that, um, the reverse one we had earlier, it, it, was really, it was wiped really bad. Sometimes there's little brass sections missing. Um, it's always just a good idea to go ahead and replace these. Torquing 4x4 has them. Uh, Torquing 4x4 also lists on their website. Um, they have a small selection of OEM synchronizers, which is about the coolest thing ever. So looking at the blocker ring here, um, there's going to be a little bit of wear um, on because obviously they're rubbing on a brass pad. But make sure there's no gouges or scratches. You can simply scuff, scuff them up with a scotch brite pad. Um, and they should clean up nice. And just double check to make sure you get a good engagement and spinning. So you, when you pull your when you pull your hub up your slider off your hub, I mean, you need to take note that there's, I'm sorry, there's a, uh, there's like a little ring grooved into one side, um, just for orientation. I've taken measurements, I haven't really found a whole lot of difference either way. Um, but just make sure you put it back together the same way you took it apart. Set aside your springs and your keys here. Um, you can reuse them if you want. We always replace them with a little bit heavier duty spring. Um, so now what you have here, your hub, your actual inner hub, and your race, these are um, pressed onto the shaft, so we've got to go back over to the press here momentarily uh, to get these off. Okay, okay so now we got this chucked up in the, um, in the press here. Um, what you're going to do to get the hub and the race up, and, and you can take these both off at the same time, um, because third gear here is very mounted, or it's supposed to be, uh, this one is no longer, uh, but you can actually get the arbor plates underneath third gear to push this whole assembly up as one. Uh, Wyatt, you want to go ahead and do that? Yeah. Hit, the, hit the button. Wow, yeah, we got a messed up shaft here. All right, so we just used the press to push off um, our fourth gear in a race. Um, you'll take note, there's a hole in this one. Um, we're gonna remove the hub, and you'll see in this oil group here, there's a oiling hole. Orientation doesn't matter because it'll fill this gap, uh, cool the race a little bit. Um, but it's just something to take note if you're putting a race on here without a hole, you're doing it wrong. <clears throat> so the hub comes off, um, and you'll, maybe if the camera can see, you'll notice there's a small groove on one side. Um, again, I haven't noticed any real dimensional differences, um, but just take note of where it was at. So we're going to take off. Wow, uh, that's a new one. I've never seen that before. So the synchro, these little... <laughs> That's good. <laughs> this is good. Yeah, we'll hear you use this. Uh, so these are have been smashed flat. Obviously, that's a problem. Um, otherwise, the wear looks okay. I'm assuming that's because it wasn't doing anything. Um, our blocker ring also looks okay. So third gear. Our good buddy third gear. Third gear has a hole in it. Um, <laughs> in the engagement plate. That's a new one. Um, Little pieces of your bearing are coming out. Um, this fluid looks kind of milky because I pressure washed this really good. Um, yeah, this this gear is seeing better days. Um, this is a unique braking pattern. It looks like it was crushed actually. 
Um, so yeah, this is no good. We're obviously going to replace this. We sourced some replacement gears from Torquing 4x4 while we were here. Um, as you can see, pieces of our inner bearing have flattened themselves. Um, this transmission was obviously ran for a very long time in this condition. <clears throat> so, the unfortunate thing here, now we've got some deep scoring. Um, and this is, a, this is a bearing journal itself, uh, right here. Um, there's no race that goes over this. So any scoring like this is obviously going to make this uh, counter shaft no good. This is, we're going to replace this, we got a spare. Um, so this is not going to be reused. Um, if you were going to reuse this, <clears throat> you would end up standing this on end. There's another set of uh, jaws, which I will find here in a second. Okay, so if you were going to reuse this counter shaft, you would need to remove this bearing. Um, and this bearing right here, you would use another set of the Miller uh, collets. These are 6447. You simply put them underneath. Make sure they fit good. You would end up putting the puller on there just like we did before and yanking this bearing right off. Uh, we're not going to do that right now. Do that right now because this is all going to get um, trucked in the scrap pile. Um, but it's the same manner as removing the other bearing. Go ahead. Okay, so we want to take a moment here before we um, uh, go any farther. We've kind of cleaned up our bell housing, uh, given a ni nice paint job. Um, so one thing you're gonna you're gonna notice, uh, as I mentioned before, there's um, a couple oiling holes here. Uh, I didn't mention where the oil actually came from. So when this thing's circulating, there's no oil pump, there's no positive pressure system. It's purely just a flinging oil bath um, lubrication setup. Um, but they did kind of take some um, things into consideration. You'll notice on these um, these counter shafts here, there's a hole. Um, so this hole is obviously where the oil will feed into. It'll come out and it'll, you know, spin real fast, centrifuge a little out of these holes, um, go out through the races, and it comes out uh, directly into the, um, those needle bearings that are supposed to be under a gear. How that works, um, this is the inside of the bell housing. It was all covered in oil before, but um, you'll notice there's like a lot of reinforcement, um, but there's above this bearing journal, and this or bearing pocket, and this bearing pocket, there's a couple of oiling holes. <clears throat> there's a couple of little diverters here that you'll see when um, we go to do our reassembly that fit, that will fit inside. And this actually goes inside the input shaft. But um, oil will come in, come down, and be diverted um, both to the bearings and then um, in through the counter shaft out into the needle bearing. So there is some sort of a system to channel oil to the, to the lower bearings. Um, nothing really for the upper side, that's a solid shaft. Uh, that's just something we wanted to bring up. Uh, make sure that when you are reusing your shaft here, you take some time to clean it out. Shine a light in there. Um, <clears throat> it up right clean. Make sure there's no gunk inside that's going to block that up because that could cause the bearing failure that we saw um, on, uh, on this one. Uh, if there's no oil. Okay. All right, guys. So now we got our main shaft up on the table. So our super expensive, fancy holding tools can be set aside, and now you'll be able to see what I was talking about. Um, so the main shaft assembly from input uh, to the output is actually two pieces that are not connected. Okay, so the only thing holding them together in a line is this little pocket bearing inside this race that's recessed. Um, and it sits right on there just like that. So, um, the reason I'm discussing this um, is because both Setting the depth on that bearing is incredibly important, but also <clears throat> uh, when we go to set our end plate at the end, you know, some people see the the range. It's two to six thousandths is the acceptable um, end plate for this for this shaft here. Um, highly encourage you to keep it as close to two as possible to minimize the amount of room it has to both wiggle and then also do this sort of thing. Um, that deflection, I think, has a lot to do with some teeth failures on some gears, but that's a topic for another story. Um, so this is your input shaft assembly. I'm going to set this aside. It simply just lifts up. Um, we'll have some work to do on that later. <clears throat> Pull our synchro out. This synchro looks okay. Definitely nice high mileage synchro. Okay, so as we're going to start disassembling this main shaft here, there's an external snap ring. We're going to set that aside. Uh, also a replaceable item from Torquing 4x4. 
Now we're going to need a set of, um, we're going to need the correct collars for this bearing. Uh, before we get too far on that though, um, I've kind of skipped over it as we've gone on the other hubs, but since this one is so wide open, I want to touch on it here. Um, there's a, inside you've seen these keys, there's a spring inside with a ball that the ball actually rides up against this hub. And as you can see, it provides spring tension. Um, you'll see the spring deflects down to help keep this hub in place. It'll also go flying. Beep! Wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> but as you can see, um, there's a little groove. There's a, there's a small groove inside this hub here. That's where that ball rides. Um, or the, 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 the ball will kind of set inside these little grooves here in the middle. Obviously this doesn't rotate on the hub, but it'll kind of find its little happy place in that little center groove. Again, there's a notch for orientation. Uh, so then now we're onto the hub assembly itself. Once we get this rear bearing off, we can pop this off. Okay, so continuing with our disassembly here, um, we are going to utilize collar number uh, Miller 8234 um, to remove this bearing from uh, this the front main shaft, this front pocket bearing. Um, there we go. And we use that collar with the Miller 6444 puller. There we go. And so Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. So you can use just simply a 9 16 and a crescent wrench to hold the puller. This gets a little awkward because it's so high. If you need to, you can I'm all slimy here, so this is... Okay, so bearing fought us a little bit, um, but once the bearing's off, we can remove the hub. Uh, as you can see, again, there's an indication for directional. Um, on the other tree, pay attention to which way that goes. Um, you'll see six gear here. It's now exposed and free spinning. You check the condition of our blocker ring, it looks okay. The synchronizer is pretty, pretty worn. There's some pitting. Obviously, we're going to replace it, but. Here is the little princess of this transmission here. So this is six gear. Six gear can be the weak point if you abuse it because as you can see, it's not a very big, it's not a very big gear. So when you're in overdrive, when you're in six gear, this big gear that we're using for a spacer, that big gear on the counter shaft is turning this gear on the main shaft. This is all that's connecting front to back. This is why we say don't tow or do anything really heavy in six gear because she doesn't have a lot to work with. So it rides on a needle bearing. Those look okay. Uh, and then that concludes our main shaft for this side. This, these gears are actually cast as part of the unit. We're gonna be replacing our main shaft. Obviously so you, you see there's a severe rust problem, but our main shaft, because this connects third gear, and third gear is obviously flopping all around, having a party. 
We've got a chipped tooth right there, some chipped teeth right here. Obviously a really bad rust problem. Um, so we're just gonna swap out our new main shaft. Um, we've got a main shaft from Torquing 4x4 we're gonna throw in. But this side is done. We gotta flip it over and start from the other side. Okay, so we've got our uh, main shaft flipped over. We're actually gonna disassemble it from the other side now towards the output. Um, so on the top half, to get this massive bearing off, we've got um, this nice fitted snap ring here. So we're gonna do our, oops, we're gonna use our other ones here. Remove this guy, maybe. First gear. Now the really big collars for the 6444. <clears throat> okay, so now to remove the first gear um, bearing here, we're going to be using Miller 8271. Throw this guy on there. We're going to outfit our 6444 puller. We're going to take off the small little bolts. Um, torquing 4x4 has one set up already for the long, for the long bolts. So that's what we need. The other clamshell. Thing on. And our support collar. Okay. Now you want to do your best not to try to goober up the main shaft, but ours is getting replaced. Okay. Now this is a big bearing. It's on here with a lot of power. I may need to too high of a stand. Okay, so we've popped the bearing off, but you'll notice there's a heavy thrust washer that goes underneath. Thrust washer, just a heavy piece of steel. First gear will come off uh, with the inner synchro apparently. So these ones are unique. Is a needle bearing. These ones are unique, they're different from all the other synchronizers. They have an outer standard synchro and then they have an inner piece. <clears throat> so this inner piece connects to the hub, the um, synchronizer connects to the gear. I believe it's just from um, adding a second friction surface because you're spinning such a big gear. Uh, helps give it the uh, the strength that it needs. You want to check for the same sorts of gouges, pitting, wear pattern, anything like that. <clears throat> okay, there's that. Now, uh, this, the remaining, um, the remaining uh, inner race, the hub, and this gear can all be pushed off as one. So we're going to head back over to the press. Um, so we're going to finish up the disassembly on our main shaft here. So we got um, second gear, the synchro assembly, and the hub, as well as the first gear inner race. <coughs> um, these two are, the, the inner race and the hub are pressed on. This is a bearing mounted gear. We're going to press it all off as one assembly. Go ahead, Wyatt. So we got these pressed loose. We have our first gear in a race. Um, there's no hole in it, just a regular flat race. <clears throat> the hub comes off. Yet again, there's another orientation groove. And we have the synchro blocker ring for second gear. The synchronizer friction cone itself looks pretty good actually. <clears throat> the inner synchronizer ring, which interfaces with the hub. Also in really good shape. So again, this synchronizer 
setup is unique to one and two. And then we have second gear comes right off. And the needle bearing. And now we have ourselves a bare main shaft. Um, again, this one's pretty substantially damaged. So we are going to be replacing it. And we have a nice replacement from working for it. All right, so now we're gonna take the two bearing races out of the back of the main case here. We're gonna use for the uh, main shaft bearing race, it's Miller part number 83, or 8237, sorry. And that'll knock this race, it'll sit right there.